Good afternoon to, every, to everyone. I'd like to welcome all the participants to this uh, uh, research session dedicated to how improve teaching and evaluate transversal uh, skills that are topics very relevant in the context of educational research. So I thanks to all the uh, speakers and um, in terms of the uh, contributions and uh, uh, the, we have three um, papers, three works. Uh, one uh, um, is uh, presented by uh, Fagiano, Monaco, Rizzo and Vaccaro, the first one that is uh, uh, dedicated to um, an, uh, uh, presented uh, results of a research from the teacher point of view, and in particular, this uh, work investigate the, um, through the voice of teacher, the link between the invalsi test in mathematics and teaching learning processes. The second uh, contribution is uh, um, from uh, Camilla Spagnolo and Marta Saccoletto, and it's uh, also dedicated to uh, mathematics, but in this case, from a student point of view. And the main goal of this paper is to investigate student multiple difficulties in mathematics, which may depend both on student characteristics, such for example, skill, knowledge, competence, and, and also his beliefs and attitudes, or uh, by peculiarity of the question is, uh, itself. And the research uh, refers to the map. Sorry? Map. Sorry? Okay, <laughs> and, and the, the arguments uh, is uh, the research is uh, dedicated to students of secondary uh, upper school. And then uh, the last uh, uh, contribution is from uh, Susanna Toth and is uh, dedicated uh, in this case uh, to another uh, domain, so the domain of grammar, and uh, refers to low secondary school also in terms of uh, um, student point of view. And the main goal of this uh, research is understanding what are the characteristics that differentiate the arguments that lead to the identification of a current answer from those that lead to choosing an incorrect answer. So it's a qualitative uh, study, but with uh, interesting contents. So uh, we can uh, move. So I give you a remind uh, to the speakers that they have a disposal 20 minutes for presentation and 10 minutes for question at the end of each uh, presentation. So, um, Let's uh, start. Let's start with the first uh, speaker, with the first uh, presentation. I invite uh, Eleonora and uh, Valentina to share the uh, slides. Thank you. And, uh, okay, give the floor to Valentina and uh, Eleonora. Thank you. I check the time at uh, when uh, five minutes left. I interrupt the presentation to indicate uh, that is. Uh, there are uh, only five minutes. Okay, thank you. Let's go. So, what in this talk? I'm here with Valentina on behalf of the other authors, and there should be also Violetta Leona Leonati, hopefully, to be in. And uh, we present and discuss uh, uh, the early result of an interdisciplinary research project uh, aiming at studying the connection between invalsi assessment and the mathematics teaching and learning processes at primary school level. The basic assumption of the research is that the complex system of data behind, within and beyond invalsi assessment can be considered as a tool for students to receive feedback on their learning, for teachers to design and implement meaningful teaching activities, but also within the context of teacher professional development in order to meet teachers' need, thus fostering a more effective didactic impact on the tests. Uh, the project is conducted by the Invalsi Group Didactics and Disciplinary Knowledge, uh, Osservatorio Permanente uh, Didattiche Saperi Disciplinari of the Italian Society of Educational Research, 
which is composed of disciplinary experts, pedagogists, and expert teachers with the aim of investigating through the voice of the teachers, perceptions, meanings, and practices of teachers with respect to the Invalsimat test, we designed a survey that was administered to a sample of more than 500 primary school teachers. We build this framework in order to specify the different uh, research variables we were interested in and the research hypothesis concerning the relationship among the variables. The variables framework consists of three macro sections, one concerning mathematics teaching professionalism and uh, one related to, teacher, to teachers' attitude toward the Balsimat um, tests and one in which personal information, personal data and context data are collected. According to the research variables framework, the survey consists of the following three sections of questions. One concerning mathematics education, how teachers interpret the Invalsi item and, the, and their results. One relating to aspects of general education, which beliefs and attitude teachers have and how they put them into teaching practices, one that collects personal data and context information. In this talk, we mainly focus on the first section of the questionnaire, which was composed by two parts. In the first part, seven invalsi items of grade five or six are presented in their original formulation. For each of them, questions aim to investigate the teacher's pedago pedagogical knowledge of the mathematical content. Misconception, recurring errors, level of difficulty. In addition, the second part, comparative questions are proposed on the proximity remoteness of the seven invalsi items uh, from teaching practices and national guidelines and on the effectiveness of uh, the considered seven invalsi items in assessing certain skills. This, this slide shows uh, one of the items from 2009 grade five math test to which only 33% of Italian students gave the correct answer. The item required, uh, required to manage a non-trivial conversation transformation between two different uh, semiotic registers. We were interested in investigating teachers' understanding of the difficulty of this item. For this purpose, without informing participants about the percentage of the correct answer given by the students, we asked how difficult they think the item is for fifth grade students. As it can be seen, 79.5% of teachers estimate the difficulty to be at most five, and so we can see we can say that this item was not considered to be a difficult item. So teachers' perception of student difficulties does not correspond to the Invalsi national data. Despite this discrepancy, results also, also confirm that the item is among the seven used in the survey, the one which is considered the most suitable for assessing learning with 86.2% of teachers, which evaluate its suitability ranking it three or four out of four, and one of the most commonly used in assessment tests with 87.6% of teachers, stating to be using this type, this type of item in their assessment test, ranking it three or four out of four. Another example of the question in, uh, in the survey is the one concerning this uh, grade six in Valsi item. Here, students were expected to notice that uh, at each step of this sequence, the altitude is reduced by one while the width increases by one. According to the nationwide result, 85.8% of students currently grew has requested the next rectangle in the sequence. However, 
more than half of the students that passed part A failed part B. The nationwide result confirm that it is clear, at least in an intuitive way, what is happening in the sequence. The issue at stake that prevented most of the students to give them the correct answer, recognizing that the perimeter stays the same, um, it is the common misconception uh, uh, that areas and perimeters should behave in the same way. However, literature shows that the construction of the meaning connected with the relationship between perimeter and area has not only an epistemological nature, but also a didactical nature. And for this reason, in order to understand teachers' awareness of the origin of student errors, we ask participants to give their interpretation of the nationwide result. In particular, we ask them the reason why, although 85.8% of students answered correctly to part A, only 35% of students correctly choose uh, C in part B, while almost the same number choose D. More precisely, we offered some particular options to recognize the different approaches by the teachers. Uh, pupils do not pay attention while reading the text. Pupils do not know area and perimeter, for, and perimeter formula well. Pupils led astray by the picture. And pupils believe that the area increases while the perimeter increases. This is the answer we expected uh, from a teacher aware of the didactical and epistemological issues at play, uh, while we expected the first and the third to be chosen by teachers not really aware of what is happening. And we hypothesize that teachers who choose the second option reduce the idea of perimeter and area to the use of formula instead of considering the more general geometric uh, concept involved in the question. It can be seen that only the 21.5 of teachers recognize that the reason for students' error is connected with the misconception that areas and perimeters should behave in the same way. Further elements are unveiled analyzing teachers' responses to the next two questions of the survey regarding the same item. The first was meant to investigate uh, teachers' awareness of the suitability of the item in order to assess students' learning at grade five. The second aimed to know uh, to what extent teachers claim to use this kind of item in their ordinary assessment test. As it can be seen in these tables, although 23.4% of teachers considered the item completely suitable to assess students' learning, the percentage of teachers who declared they regularly use this kind of items in their classroom uh, is limited to 6.3%. Using the uh, Spurman's raw, uh, we also analyzed the correlation between these two questions and the SSPS computation returns as a, a, a significant correlation, which says that teachers state they use this kind of item consistently with how much they deem it is it suitable uh, to assess students' learning. Um, and on the other end, as it could be expected, there is a very good correlation between perceived suitability and declared use in the classroom. Finally, we consider worthy of note uh, the participants' answers to one of the questions in the second section in the questionnaire in which we ask the teacher to express the level of agreement with the set of claims. And in particular, the fourth of this claim is the one we can read here. Analyzing invalsy items can help teachers understand what a mathematics learning aims are to be achieved. And we found interesting that 
the percentage of teachers uh, who completely agreed with this claim increases from 22.2% of the overall results to 33.7% when restricting the sample to the, those teachers, the 21.5% that recognized the, the reason of students error by choosing the, the correct option number four uh, to the previous question. Uh, the last example we present is the one concerning the invalsi item uh, on the altitude of, the, of a triangle. According to the nationwide results, only 51.5% of students were able to answer the item uh, correctly, uh, drawing a line uh, perpendicular to the side uh, AB. Mm, the difficulty of drawing the altitude uh, of a triangle given in a non-standard uh, position is well known in the literature. Uh, Gutierrez and Jamie, uh, Martini and Sbaragli, and more recently Samir, uh, uh, Tiras and Levenson uh, show that fifth grade students believe that the altitude has to be vertical, even if it appears to satisfy the formal definition. And we know that this phenomenon could be explained by the overexposure to prototypes of vertical altitudes in the books and by the teachers uh, that may impede the growth of fuller concept acquisition. So similarly to the uh, previous item, uh, we asked participants to give their interpretation of the nationwide results, uh, choosing among uh, uh, these options in order to explain uh, the reasons of the reason of students' error. Um, again, pupils do not pay attention while reading the text. Pupils do not know the definition of altitude uh, uh, of a triangle well. Uh, pupils are led astray by the picture, and pupils think that the altitude should be vertical. Uh, it can be seen that participants would recognize that, that the reason is connected with the misconception that the altitude should be vertical are 34.6%. Uh, also for this item, we were interested in uh, investigating teachers' awareness of its uh, suitability in order to assess the students' learning at uh, fifth grade and to know to what extent teachers claim they use this kind of item in their ordinary assessment test. Uh, looking at the responses, we found that the 50% of teachers considered this item uh, completely suitable to assess the students' learning, and that 39% of participants declared they regularly use this kind of item. Uh, moreover, it can be seen that 35% of the teachers gave the maximum rank to both this question, in particular, that they made up 70% of those uh, who considered the item completely suitable to assess students' learning. However, the 74.2% of them were not able to identify the reason of students' error in answering the item. That is, 22.6% of participants even considering this item to be completely, completely suitable to assess a student's learning and declaring they regularly use this kind of item in their assessment test, did not recognize the reason for student's error. In other terms, it is almost one teacher out of eight that consider this item to be completely suitable to assess students' learning, declares to regularly use this kind of item, and was able to recognize the reasons for students' error. Only one out of eight. Finally, we consider worth noticing that uh, even if participants recognizing the reasons for students' error make up 21.5%, for the item of rectangles and um, okay. and 34.6% uh, for the item on the altitude. 
those who were able to recognize uh, both the issues were only 9.2%. However, 64.8% of teachers considers the two items suitable, partially or completely, to assess fifth grade students' learning. And one teacher out of two declares to use often or regularly both these kinds of items in their assessment practices. So to conclude, how can we interpret this data? We use the construct of the metadidactical conflict by Ferdinando Arzarello and Federica Ferretti, according to which uh, discourses about didactical issues, such as the student ability, the reason for students' error, the assessment and its formative point of view, might reveal the presence of discrepancies. This metadidactical conflict seems indeed to, em to emerge from our data with uh, its three main components. The first component concerns teachers' perception of student difficulties in tackling invasive items. Our results show how teachers often, often have a perception which is not in tune with invasive national data. The second component concerns the teacher's interpretation of student awareness and mistakes. With this respect, teachers' responses also revealed a discrepancy with the national data. The third component refers to the contradictory responses of the teachers to the questions of the survey dealing with the overall rationale of the invasive assessment, such as the suitability to assess students' learning or the compliance with the curriculum national guidelines and using classroom practice. We are now still analyzing our complex data set in a quantitative way, and we are already planning for further uh, qualitative uh, insights. On the basis of our results, uh, we intend to draw up guidelines that allow mathematics teachers educators to overcome the metadidactical conflict and obtain a real improvement of practices regarding the use of invasive standardized tests in the school. Thank you very much for your, for your attention and a special thanks to all uh, the research group. Okay. okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for your very interesting presentation and uh, issues that emerge from this accurate study on uh, teacher point of view that is uh, uh, very interesting and not so uh, analyzed in the literature. So I think it is a very good example of how to use the embassy data for enrich the uh, literature on these uh, topics. So um, many que any question from the audience about this uh, research, curiosity, something to know? Okay. No question. So I have uh, only only one question uh, about the uh, sample of uh, the teachers. You say I don't. I didn't uh, understand the number of the teacher involved in the sample. Sorry, uh, due maybe due to some noise. Uh, and uh, also, um, which kind of school? Primary school, but in which count? Uh, in which city? In which municipality? And uh, um, also a question about the uh, scale that you used in the, in the questionnaire, uh, in particular the, cho the choice of a um, scale from one to 10 for uh, control, for um, analyze the, the uh, perception of difficulty and why a, a scale with four modality or four category for the other uh, question. And uh, okay, thank you. For... Thank you, Eleonora. Do you want to? No. Okay. 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 So, Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the sample is um, about five hundred teachers. Five hundred. Sorry. Five hundred. Five hundred twenty-seven, to be precise. <laughs> okay. Of valid. Uh, 
It's a, oh, it's, a, it's a good number. It's a satisfactory number. It is uh, the population, obviously, and the size is strictly linked to the to the original population where the uh, num the sample derived. But okay, it's good. Okay, the population is um, um, at most on the northeast and the center of Italy, but uh, we have uh, teachers from uh, all the state. All the okay, and all the how, regions. How did you choose uh, these uh, uh, teachers? Uh, voluntary participation. Voluntary participation. Yes, we. Um, uh, we ask uh, to the regional um, services for, for school to, to ask teachers and uh, uh, principal of the school to respond to these uh, questions. And did you find any particular characteristics of the teacher that, uh, uh, give, uh, that uh, give the answer? Yes, the, um, they are uh, uh, auto selection bias in uh, the composition of the sample. Do you think something about this? Yes, they are um, teachers, very expert teacher. Uh, they they are uh, in role uh, so uh, from at least uh, five years. Okay. So. Uh, they, they are uh, all of primary school and um, what we can see. Okay. Leonora, uh, are women, you remember? Are women, I suppose. Mainly are women, I suppose. Yes, or yes. Only one, uh, one male uh, teacher. <laughs> but it depends only on the composition of the population of teacher in general because yes. I. I think that uh, in general, uh, the uh, teacher of primary school uh, are women in a major percentage. Okay. And what about the scale that you use? Uh, the scale is uh, one, um, one of four for, uh, because uh, the, um, uh, we have uh, two uh, validity scale, uh, already validate scale for the pedago pedagogical um, part of the, the survey. So we intend to use the same scale on the other questions. Uh, the um, multiple choice questions with uh, error, students error reasons are uh, on, uh, we have uh, five options. Uh, for uh, close option and one open option uh, with uh, other uh, reasons for the error. Okay. Okay. And they are all the same to confront the data. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Valentina. Thank you. Any other question from the audience? Uh, curiosity. Nothing else. Okay. Okay. So if nobody has anything else to add, we can continue with the. Next uh, contribution, the next contribution is uh, uh, from Camilla Spagnolio and Marta Saccoletto. So let's start and uh, give the floor to Marta uh, and Camilla. Thanks. I share the slide. Okay. Um, so, uh, good afternoon, every, everyone. Um, thank you for the opportunity to present our study here. And um, I'm Camilla Spagnolo, a researcher of uh, University of Bolzano. And uh, today I will present uh, together with my colleague, Marta Saccoletto, PhD student at the uh, University of Torino, a research project titled the Difficulty Perception in Answering Argumentative Invalsi Tests, um, a qualitative study. So the aim of this project is uh, to study the perceived difficulties related to invalsi argumentative tasks. Mm -hmm. And uh, in particular, we want to um, investigate how and uh, how much the difficulty perceived uh, by students uh, is uh, related to difficulty that uh, is attributed to the task by the teachers and uh, uh, the possible connection with uh, the skill levels uh, constructed by Invalsi. 
So, uh, in particular, um, we conducted the first qualitative study to investigate the perceived difficulty from the student pers uh, perspective and relationships between uh, um, perceived difficulty and student performance in uh, math. Uh, we use uh, um, we use the two different types of instrument, a questionnaire and uh, interviews uh, directed uh, uh, both uh, at uh, students. Um, the sample consisted in uh, seventy nine students in um, uh, in grades uh, nine and ten from the same high school, and um, the methodology. Uh, the questionnaire um, was administered in person using uh, Google Forms, while the interviews were conducted uh, remotely using uh, instead uh, Google Meets. So um, both apps from uh, G Suite uh, Google. And uh, um, all of this took place in uh, October uh, of the last year. And um, Sorry, okay. Uh, this research has already been addressed in, uh, in the literature. Uh, in recent years, uh, several authors uh, have investigated how the variation of some elements uh, within the questions can impact uh, the student's behavior and the perception of uh, difficulty. Also, uh, one formulation is not necessarily uh, better or worse uh, than, uh, than another, but uh, changing uh, the, um, the wording actually changed the problem and uh, can affect students' approach to, to the problem itself. Uh, the text factor um, include, for example, editing or uh, punctuation, uh, syntactic uh, complexity, uh, word density, information uh, order, uh, explicit declaration, or, uh, and so on. And, um, however, the student's uh, solution strategy can also uh, be influenced by numerical factors, such as uh, numerical magnitude. Uh, this result is uh, confirmed and uh, deeply analyzed by the Corte et al, uh, who studied who, um, who the kind of number, such uh, decimal greater or smaller than one, can affect the students' difficulties and student perceived difficulties. We want to point out that uh, in, uh, in the literature, only uh, the element uh, that influenced the difficult of, uh, of the question, um, in other words, uh, the, um, the one constructed uh, from the student's answer, uh, have been researched, but not the student's perception itself, that is the, the behavior and not their opinion or their, their point of view. So, um, starting from um, the previous uh, study results, we decided to investigate the perceived difficulties relating to the invalsi argumentative questions. Particularly, we, we pay attention to argumentative questions relating uh, to the numbers area. Uh, by first agreeing with the teachers uh, of the classes uh, involved in the experiment, experimentation, we selected the questions whose uh, contents uh, had already been dealt with. This decision made it possible to exclude that uh, the perception of difficulty with regard to the items was influenced by the fact that uh, the students did not uh, know the topics. Uh, so uh, the study is uh, divided in uh, two phases. The first one uh, is um, a qualitative uh, and uh, it is already done. And the second one is uh, quantitative, is uh, still ongoing. 
the aim uh, of the, um, the first phase uh, and uh, that is the, the one we, we want to describe in, uh, in this paper um, is the qualitative and the aim is uh, um, to investigate how students construct his uh, or her personal perception of the difficulty of argumentative questions. Uh, the aim uh, instead of the phase two um, is to understand how students perceive difficulty is related to uh, teacher perceived difficulty and whether this consists with the skills level con constructed by Invalsi. So um, the questionnaire included some Invalsi items and some other question with um, the aim of investigating the different perception of student difficulties. For this uh, first um, part, um, the focus uh, was on uh, emotional uh, factors and um, we inspired uh, uh, on uh, the study of Dan and uh, Baccalini Frank. Um, and uh, uh, for the second part, um, the second part is on uh, Invalsi tasks and in particular um, task one and question about perceived difficulty after solving the task one, task two and uh, um, questions about perceived difficulty after solving the task two, and um, at the end uh, a comparison between uh, the two tasks. So, um, why uh, start with uh, Invalsi tasks? Uh, we have chosen to start with uh, Invalsi tasks uh, in order to use uh, reference to results uh, achieved at the uh, national level, uh, to use possible comparison with the skill levels, the opportunity to work on the transversal skills such as uh, um, argumentation, and uh, developing activities and discussions with the class based on Invalsi tasks. Um, what, um, uh, what are the criteria for the choice of the Invalsi tasks? To select so to select the, the Invalsi tasks, we followed um, the, this criteria, numbers area, uh, students from grade 8 and 10, um, tasks about uh, argumentative process, uh, percent of correct answer less than 50%, and uh, the questions had the same mathematical content, and at the end, uh, tasks are similar to those already discussed uh, in class with uh, the students. So um, let's read together the, the tasks. Uh, this is the first one. Um, I translate it uh, uh, in English because uh, the original task is uh, Italian, of course. Um, so uh, N is a natural number. Uh, Antonio claims that uh, um, for N uh, minus one is always a multiple of three. Is Antonio correct? Um, the table below marks the only argument uh, that justifies the correct answer. Antonio is right because 4n minus 1 equals uh, 3n, because if n equals 4, then 4n minus 1 equals 15. And, or Antonio is not right because 4n minus 1 um, is always odd. Uh, or because if n equals 3, uh, 4n minus 1 um, equals uh, 11. So um, this is uh, the, um, the answer, the percent of the answer. So uh, we, we can read that uh, um, the correct answer is 40.3%, uh, um, the um, wrong answer is 50.2%, and the uh, missed answer is 9.6%. Uh, we focused our, our attention um, mostly for the, this, the, for the item C, um, and uh, we will see it, uh, it is significant for, for the analysis in, in the following. 
Then the, um, the tasks two. So uh, we read it together also. Uh, Mark states that uh, for every natural number uh, n greater than zero, n squared plus uh, n plus one is a prime number. Is Mark correct? Choose one of the two answer and uh, complete the sentence. So Mark is right because, or Mark is not right because. So um, uh, we can see immediately that uh, uh, one of the different uh, of, um, of these uh, two tasks uh, is that uh, one is uh, an open question and, that, and uh, the first one uh, instead is a multiple choice uh, question. Um, let's see the, the result. So, um, so uh, uh, seventeen point eight uh, choose uh, the um, the correct answer. Uh, Fifty-five point three um, percent uh, uh, choose the wrong answer. Uh, choose uh, gave the wrong answer, and uh, missed answer are twenty-three point five percent. So um, uh, let's. Uh, uh, I give the the floor to Marta to proceed with the analysis. So I stop the share slide and... Uh, no. Yeah, we can see. Okay, thanks. So uh, I present now some results from um, our data analysis. Uh, in our case, that's the task one, the first task, the first invalidity task. We can see... Oh, You can see that uh, the correct answer, the percentage of the correct answer is equal to 29.2%, so lower than uh, the tools for the national level. And also we can see that 25% uh, of the students answers that uh, Antonio is right because for n minus one is equal to to 3n, so they show a difficulty in calcul uh, with a literal calculation, sorry. Uh, but above all, we can see that 40.3% of students answer that Antonio isn't right because for n minus one is always an odd number. Uh, we found interesting this, this so high percentage. Uh, so we inquired this a little. And we, we found two main reasons why students choose this answer. Um, the first one, you can see uh, a sample of student justification here on the slide. Um, and uh, so this, this student here is focused on the fact that uh, this statement is true. And he does not understand that uh, this is not a valid justification. Um, but some other students, and that uh, emerged uh, mostly during the interview, they was, uh, uh, their interpretation of uh, for n minus one was incorrectly. So they, they thought that for n minus one was a formula for any other number. So like two n plus one. So they were thinking this, it could be any odd number and not all the odd numbers are multiple of three. So this is a difficulty in the interpretation of the formula, but not in the not in understanding what is a valid justification. For the second task, okay, uh, we, we have a very low percentage of uh, correct answer. So the, just 9% of students uh, uh, answered correctly at this question. And um, almost 50 of students understand that Marco is not right. So they choose the right spot where they had to write the, the answer. But, um, but they, 
they did not produce a valid justification. Um, almost all the, all the answers were of the kind no because no, like the first one in the, in the slide. So he isn't right because it's not always a prime number. And um, or of the kind of the last one, so it depends from the value of n. So this is of course true, but it's not a valid justification. Anyway, as Camilla already said, we, um, we focused on difficulty perception, on students' difficulty perception. And, okay, sorry. Okay, so after they solved the task, the invalid task, we asked them on a scale one, very easy to 10, very difficult. How difficult did you find this task? And we can observe in this graph that there is not such a difference between the two graphs. Um, and the students' answers are distributed among all choice options. And the answer average is five in both cases. So it seems not to be such a difference uh, between the difficulty that the students perceive for these uh, two invalid tasks. But we also, okay, we also ask students at the end of the questionnaire, which of the two tasks did you find more difficult? And here we can see that almost 50% of students answered that they found the second task more difficult. So um, we perceived a mismatch between uh, these two answers. And also we inquired these uh, in, for each student and we found that also for each student, uh, there are some uh, discrepancies. So for example, here, the, um, this uh, blue point stands for a student that answer six for the difficult level for the first task and eight for the second task. But he said that the first task was more difficult. So there is an incoherence between this answer. That could be linked with the fact that uh, students have difficulty to, um, to attribute a difficulty level. Okay. Uh, moreover, we, we also Sorry. Uh, we also compare, we also investigate the relationship between students' difficulty perception and the fact that they answered correctly or incorrectly to the invalid task. Uh, we try to, so we try to inquire if students tend to perceive it as easier if they answer correctly or vice versa. So on, on these graphs, um, on the X axis, we have the student difficulty perception. So for example, here, we have the students that they said that uh, the first item was, uh, difficulty was difficult five. And 11 students said that first item was difficult five and they answered incorrectly. And two students answer correctly and they said that uh, the first item was difficult five. So if, you, uh, if we observe this graph, uh, we can see that there is not such a correlation between the fact that uh, a students answer wrong, um, correct or incorrect and uh, how, how difficult uh, he, he find the question. He found the question. Okay. Only five minutes, uh, Marta. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I just say uh, that. So we also. Um, sorry, we also compare the. 
relationship between the difficulty perception and the perception of preparation. So uh, we we ask students after uh, they solve the task, of course, to attribute a level of their preparation. That is, we ask them, do you feel prepared to answer this question from a scale to one? I'm not at all prepared to five, so I'm fully prepared. And here um, we can see that it seems to be um, a much more correlation between the fact that they felt themselves prepared to the question, that the fact that they felt um, that they found difficulty or not the, the question. For example, here, they answer that uh, the question, the first item was difficult one or two, and they said that uh, their uh, preparation level was equal three, four, or five. Or here, they said that the, the, the item was really difficult, and they said that they weren't prepared for, for answering. But of course, for example, for five, we can see all the level preparation. Okay. So in conclusion, um, this first qualitative study highlighted that uh, perception of difficulty involves more metacognitive aspects and um, the perception of one's own training. And uh, perception of difficulty is less influenced, in, influenced by the actual ability of the student and the difficulty of the task. So, for example, um, one's uh, perception of difficulty can be influenced by, um, by how much time I have studied and not by how much I have learned. Or uh, it may be influenced by having seen similar tasks uh, in class, but not by actually being able to solve them. Um, so, we conclude with possible future uh, developments uh, that may be partially solved uh, in the development of the phase two of our study. So, um, to study student perceived uh, difficulty before and after addressing uh, a, quest a question, uh, to quantitatively study the perceived difficulty, to change uh, the type of questions uh, and choose uh, um, simpler uh, difficulties? And um, is it possible to sort questions uh, by perceived difficulty? Um, to compare the student perceived difficulty level with the embalsy difficulty level? And uh, at the end, uh, we, um, we think it, is, it, it, will be, it will be interesting to compare the students' perceived difficulty level with the teachers' perceived difficulty level. So, um, thank you for uh, your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Camilla and Marta. Please uh, uh, close your presentation. Close your Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you for uh, your uh, very interesting uh, uh, research. Uh, is um, has some uh, contact with the previous uh, uh, research in terms of the perceived difficulty. In this case, from a student point of view, but uh, the problem is uh, uh, similar, and uh, some tools are the same. So, uh, any question, uh, curiosity from the uh, audience? about uh, this uh, this paper it's clear are you satisfied of the presentation anybody wants to break the ice no okay so um, again just uh, one question one or two question <laughs> On, um, again, on the uh, composition of the sample, because uh, 
also in this case is a sample, a sample of students, uh, 79, so it's not so large a sample, but uh, I think that it is possible to enlarge uh, this uh, sample to include more students. And, but uh, um, how did you choose the, uh, the students? Uh, it's, uh, uh, the students belong to a particular school, or are coming from a different school or the same school, different school, different class. What's about the sample and the characteristics? Because I think that the results depend strictly on the quality of the sample. So I suggest to increase the sample and take into account the heterogeneity of the units in terms of the characteristics that can influence, that can affect the results. So Camilla or Marta? Yeah, um, uh, the sample uh, is uh, a convenient sample and it uh, it is a, a small sample, uh, in fact, uh, so small. Not, not so large. Eh? Not yeah, so no, small. yeah, but, but for a qualitative study, in yeah. fact, and um, we, um, we um, consider uh, students from the same school, the same high school and the same uh, um, address, we can uh, translate it in science, human science, I think. And um, so um, uh, it, it is why uh, we, we should, we, we choose to, um, to analyze them qualitatively and um, only in the phase two, we, we consider a, a larger sample and then we, we, we analyze the, it uh, quant in, uh, in a quantitative uh, way. So, um, okay. Okay, okay, thank you. And what about the choice of the two tasks? Uh, the two tasks are first are similar, okay, uh, the same content, the same domain numbers. Uh, are you interested in considering other domains? Is, is uh, an intention for the future works? Consider, for example, I'm curious about the uh, question on uh, uh, domain data and previsioni because yeah. of the decision. So I'm quite curious about uh, the impact uh, of argument uh, question in this uh, domain uh, data and prediction because uh, the students are um, tend, uh, mm. most are familiar with calculation but have some problem with the argumentation of the results and this is a typical problem in statistical context mm. uh, the students are able to calculate mean and make mean but uh, are not able to understand the results so uh, can you see, uh, can you think that it is uh, reasonable to consider other domains? Of uh, course, of course. And uh, we, we choose uh, uh, one focus or, 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 or uh, uh, maybe it is better to say uh, two focus because uh, one is uh, the area and it is a numbers area. And the second one is uh, the, the argumentative uh, tasks. And, uh, but we, we want to consider all, all the tasks, uh, but uh, one by one, uh, because uh, the, um, the, um, the topic is, uh, um, is, is uh, just large. So uh, we, um, we decided to, uh, to choose one and uh, explore this. Then we, 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 we explore also the other one. And we choose uh, the, to start with um, this area because of the period uh, uh, we, we, we choose with the, with the students and with the teachers. So in, uh, in that month, uh, they, um, they start with, uh, with these, uh, these, um, these tasks, uh, these uh, content, content. And so we, we choose uh, it's, it's the, the motivation for, uh, for our uh, decision, so. Okay, thank you, in the future, in the future. Yeah, in the future. Enlarge <laughs> the sample, enlarge the question, the task you will consider. Okay, thank you very much. Any question from the audience? Okay, so let's move to the last uh, presentation. The last presentation is uh, from uh, uh, Susanna Tots and uh, Susanna. Okay. Thank you very much. 
Okay, uh, give the floor to Susanna for the last uh, presentation, or, uh, also in this case, 20 minutes, uh, more or less, uh, and uh, 10 minutes for uh, discussion. So give the floor, Susanna, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Susanna. I'm going to talk about uh, grammar, and um, I, I will focus on students' reasoning on the grammar questions in the Invalsi tests. I'm really interested in what can we learn from students' reasoning on language awareness questions. Um, I think that we can learn a lot from the students, but uh, particularly we can find out interesting information about two things directly relevant for the tests. One of them is competence levels in language awareness. So when we analyze students' reasoning, we can gain a deeper understanding of what do students typically know at a given competence level. And uh, we can also explore uh, how language awareness tasks work in the sense that what kind of knowledge or competence is stimulated by language awareness tasks in our tests. So uh, during this presentation, I will give a short theoretical introduction to the concept of language awareness, which is a concept I often use uh, instead of speaking about grammar. We'll see why. And then uh, I will analyze the descriptors of competence levels in language awareness and identified on the basis of the Invasi test results. And uh, finally, I'll present a qualitative study on how students solve language awareness questions representing different competence levels. So uh, I'm going to focus only on the so-called grammar questions or language awareness questions within the Italian test. So what is language awareness? It is a broader concept than grammar. According to the Association of Language Awareness, it can be defined as explicit knowledge about language and conscious perception and sensitivity in language learning and language use. So that means that it has two major components. It has an implicit component. So we have an implicit linguistic competence, a linguistic sensitivity, which is also part of language awareness, and then explicit knowledge about language. So in other words, that means that language awareness is partly conscious, partly intuitive. And language awareness questions in the Invalsi tests require the exploitation of both explicit knowledge about language and implicit linguistic competence. The factors that seem to be influencing their difficulty, that is their collocation along the competence scale, are the following. The degree of explicitness of the analysis these questions require and the prototypicality of the linguistic elements they focus on, and the complexity of four meaning relationships in the given linguistic uh, task or linguistic element. We are going to see how these factors work together in a second. So um, when we describe competence levels on the basis of the Invasi test, we analyze task clusters. So uh, the language awareness tasks are located on a competence scale on the basis of the test results. So this is based on statistical analysis. And the next step is that uh, we divide the competence scale into competence levels. So that is still a statistical issue. And then each competence level uh, corresponds to a task cluster along the competence scale. So when we describe competence levels, we basically describe task clusters. So the description of each competence level is based on the description of the corresponding task clusters in terms of what students typically know uh, and do at a given competence level. So uh, this means that when we describe a competence levels in language awareness, we have uh, the statistics based on students' answers, and then we have the theory about language awareness, about in implicit and explicit competence, but we cannot really see what the students are doing when they answer these questions. So this is something I ask myself all the time when we work on the description of competence levels or when we create new language awareness tasks. I always ask myself, 
are the students really doing what we imagine <laughs> or are they answering our questions in a completely different way? And uh, therefore, the research questions re uh, leading my qualitative research were the following. So how do students solve language awareness tasks? What kind of reasoning is activated by these tasks? And to what extent are the descriptors of competence levels observable in students' reasoning? Uh, this is why I decided to do a qualitative research by conducting focus group interviews based on language awareness tasks administered at grade eight. So that is the third year class of lower secondary school. And um, altogether, I interviewed 62 students and I have uh, 360 minutes of interview data um, conducted in three different classes. So third year of lower secondary school and then the first and second year class of upper secondary school. The data analysis is still pro in progress because qualitative content analysis is an extremely time consuming process. So uh, first, I decided to do a deductive coding based on um, previous research. So I developed a category system for the deductive coding based on previous research, and I coded uh, approximately 50% of the data. And then I gave my code system to my colleagues who are helping me, and they coded the data independently. Then we calculated uh, intercoder agreement, and we saw that it was really low. There were uh, many differences. So currently, we are uh, working on the revision of the code system. And once we um, finish the revision of our code system, we will again code the whole, recode the whole data set. Um, so, so far, I, can, I still have some interesting preliminary results I would like to discuss with you. This is the category system we created, which is based on the main characteristics of students' reasoning. So, in some cases, we can see that students focus on morphosyntactic features. In other cases, we can see that they um, carry out a focused manipulation of data. So, they try, they try maybe to transform um, uh, from the singular to the plural form. And focused manipulation is that means that we can see that students know what they are doing, that their, the manipulation of data has a purpose. In some cases, the students refer to their metalinguistic knowledge. Uh, very often, they focus on meaning and semantics, uh, or they also often carry out intuitive analysis or intuitive manipulation of data, which are less focused. In some cases, they just uh, focus their attention on distractors. Often, they apply rules of thumb and uh, some of their answers show a lack of explicit knowledge. So these are the categories we determined together after coding and uh, rewrite, uh, re <laughs> coding uh, the data independently and comparing uh, our codes. So these are the codes we all agreed on. So now I would like to show you some examples of students' reasoning on questions representing different competence levels. For instance, um, this is a level one task. I didn't translate it into English because it didn't make any sense to translate these task in, tasks into English. So basically, you can see four communicative situations here. And um, for each communicative situation, there are two sentences. For instance, in the case B, La mattina hai ordinato al tuo fornaio di da parte la tua pizza preferita, a pranzo vai al forno e dici Salve, sono venuto a ritirare una pizza, uh, or salve, sono venuto a ritirare la pizza. So there are always two sentences which differ only uh, in the presence of definite or indefinite article. And um, students have to choose the sentence they would use in that communicative situation. So it is a very intuitive task. It is a task that um, uh, triggers implicit competence that uh, we can answer this task on the basis of intuitive metalinguistic analysis, which is exactly what students do. 
So if you look at student answers, for instance, at the first item, you saw two stendipanni si è rotto, entri in un negozio e chiedi, buongiorno vorrei uno stendipanni, or buongiorno vorrei lo stendipanni, student uh, reasoning are always like this. Um, è come se dicesse, la frase uno è come se dicesse va bene uno a caso, invece se dici vorrei lo stand di panni è come se il cliente avesse già parlato con il commesso e avrebbe detto io quel stand di panni lo voglio per la prossima volta. Um, or in another case, uh, the case of the bakery and the pizza, a student says a pranzo vai al forno e dici salve, sono venuta a ritirare la pizza, ma non a ritirare una pizza perché ce n'era una in particolare. So we can see that these reasonings are very similar to each other because um, students make intuitive reference to the concept of definiteness. They don't use any terminology, any specialized terminology. Um, their answers are really based on the linguistic context, so they do not really abstract away from the context, but uh, still uh, these intuitive reasonings um, enable the students to identify a correct answer. So there is not a single student who gives an incorrect answer to this question. Um, it gets a bit trickier if we get uh, to a uh, level three task. <laughs> this is an example uh, where the task focuses on the syntactic subject. And it says, leggi la frase, Maria ha ricevuto insieme a me il premio dell'amicizia, solo una delle seguenti affermazioni è vera, quale? Il soggetto si trova alla fine della frase, il soggetto non compie l'azione, il soggetto è sottinteso, il soggetto è un pronome personale. So in this case the sentence says something like, Maria got an award for friendship. And the correct answer, so there are different claims about the subject, and the correct claim in this case it is that the subject does not complete the action, which is really challenging um, for the students to indicate because um, it contradicts one of the most um, well-known definitions about the subjects. So usually students say that the subject always completes the action and in this case the subject undergoes the actions. So the students just have to let it go and choose an answer which contradicts a very well-known definition. And uh, in this case uh, their answers uh, in their answers, they make reference to some very basic metalinguistic knowledge, but they um, tend to focus on the level of meaning and semantics. So this is really interesting because subject is a syntactic category, but students still focus on the level of meaning and semantics. So their answers are very similar, surprisingly. But um, these kind of reasonings uh, do not always lead to the identification of the correct answer. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. We cannot see a big difference between the reasonings leading to a correct answers and those leading to an incorrect answer. For instance, um, in one case, I asked the students um, what was which um, component was the subject of the sentence and uh, one student in the group said it was Maria because Maria was given something and another student says, said that the subject was the award il premio because um, in the student's opinion that was the topic of the sentence. Um, in another group students still um, base their answer on a um, focusing on meaning and semantics. Abbiamo scelto la risposta B perché è lei che riceve, non è che dà, quindi è un altro che compie l'azione. So we are still uh, on the level of meaning and semantics, but actually this is a correct answer. Um, what is surprising is that students pay very little attention to morphosyntactic features. So if you look at this picture, these are the most frequent words. Um, in students' reasoning about this question, and there is not a single reference to the concept of concept of concordance, for example. And even uh, if I tried to 
guide students' attention towards uh, this concept by asking them what happens if we uh, replace Maria by a plural noun such as le mie amiche or le ragazze, they still stayed on the level of semantics and they answered that the only thing that changes is that che devono decidere chi tiene il premio perché il premio è solo uno, so that there are more people and the award is only one. They didn't notice that in, in the, at that point we should change the verb as well because uh, there is a concordance between the subject and the verb. Uh, now we can look at a level five task which focuses on the active and passive voice and this is a really tricky task. There are many different sentences and um, for instance in sentence A, i miei genitori vanno spesso alla fiera del libro, the verb um, andare to go is used as a lexical verb with a lexical meaning while in sentence C questi moduli vanno spediti entro la fine del mese, the same verb is used as an auxiliary verb. So students uh, have to consider different levels of linguistic analysis in order to be able to answer this question. And what we see is that at this point uh, there is a significant variation in students' reasoning and uh, reasonings leading to a correct answer display a multi-layered understanding of the concept of the atheses, which takes into account syntactic, morphological, and semantic features. So they cannot focus on semantics uh, purely. Reasonings focusing on one level of linguistic analysis often leads to incorrect answers. Uh, for instance, there is a student, uh, there is a student who claims that um, in his or her opinion, the passive voice means that the subject undergoes an action. And um, actually this student applies only this criterion to decide whether the sentence is active or passive and he or she gives uh, several incorrect answers because he or she only applies this semantic criterion. So some preliminary conclusion we can draw from this data are that students' reasonings on level one and level two questions are very similar to each other. They often follow an intuitive metalinguistic analysis or are based on, metalink on a basic metalinguistic knowledge, while the variation in students' reasoning increases with questions representing higher levels of competence. And correct answers to questions located on the top of the competence level scale of, of the competence scale reflect a multi-layered understanding of grammatical phenomena. <laughs> so thank you very much for your attention, and I'll be happy to answer your questions if you have any. Oh, thank you very much, Susanna. It's a very interesting uh, um, presentation, a contribution. Uh, for me, it's not so usual to uh, to deal with uh, grammar results. Uh, I worked a lot with mathematics performance, uh, and so I'm very interested in, the, in this uh, topic because it's quite new for me. <laughs> so I don't have any particular question because my knowledge of the grammar competence uh, is uh, not so high. But I have a curiosity about uh, if you know, uh, what do you, do you think about a possible gender gap in the uh, in this kind of uh, behavior because in mathematics it is well known that uh, girls perform worse than uh, men than men. and also in reading and comprehension the uh, girls perform better but what about this uh, behavior this aspect metacognitive aspect do you have any opinion about this uh, problem about this aspect, not problem about this aspect. Yes, thank you very much for this very interesting question. But I think um, in this case, grammar is somewhere on the halfway between a, a purely linguistic subject and like a more scientific subject because you still have to follow some rules and and uh, develop some abstract reasoning skills. And um, I don't have any statistical data about this, but in my opinion, um, 
Um, no. There is not really a gender gap. In fact, I uh, when I transcribed the interviews, I did not uh, mark students' gender. I just um, gave them a number. But since I had to listen to the interviews thousand times in order to transcribe them properly, I can still hear the students when I read the transcript. And I know exactly who is a female and who is a male student. And uh, in some groups, there are um, very, very, um, there are male students with a very high um, competence in this area. <laughs> Maybe because it is a more technical subject compared to reading comprehension. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, any question from the audience? Nothing? Nobody? Okay, we are the last minutes. And uh, if uh, are you satisfied of the three presentation are very clear and interesting so maybe um, I think that uh, any curiosity uh, have been uh, find a, found an answer so uh, if uh, nobody inter want to ask something I think I say thanks to all the uh, speaker to all the participants. We finish uh, the session uh, um, early, but uh, so we have time to, uh, to have a break and to participate to other uh, future sessions. So thank you very much to the speaker, to the participant, to the uh, or uh, organizer of this session, uh, Veronica and Giuseppina, thank you for your help, for your technical help, and uh, see you then in the next uh,